Look at him. <laughs> Nothing is more exhilarating than offshore and nearshore fly fishing. I love it. Being out of sight of land, big fish in open water, sometimes it's intimidating, but no form of fly fishing is more physical and more exciting than offshore and nearshore fly fishing. Join us. Oh, you got it. Oh, wow. Yay! You're so tame when you get caught. Because this is the way you cast. This show has been brought to you by... Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet. If you think it's daunting fishing close to shore in shallow water, imagine what it's like when you're miles from land. In shallow water, you've got structure, you've got bars, you've got points, you've got rocks, you've got weed beds. Offshore, you have none of these things, so it's a whole different ball game. Luckily, there are things that tip you off to the presence of game fish offshore to help narrow it down. Of course, a knowledgeable captain is critical, as they always know where fish are expected to make an appearance, but if you're in your own boat, you can still narrow the odds. I asked my friend Captain Mike Warricky to explain rips and why they hold fish. Mike, we've got a rip out here, so what, what, um, why are the fish here, how does a rip form, and why are the fish here, and where do you look around a rip? Right now we're fishing in about 53 feet of water and behind us here we have a rip and um, the rocks come up three, four feet and the water is coming in so the water is rushing up over the, over the rocks creating a rip and we get rough water right, right through here and these fish are just setting up on the downside of that as all the sand deals come up over that bar. These fish are setting up in this, in this little bit deeper water hitting the sand deals as they're on the surface. Rips tell you a food-rich bit of shallow water is present, which creates a place where squid, shrimp, and especially bait fish get trapped where game fish can corral them and pick them off. So look for fish feeding anywhere along a rip, or just try casting there because it's a high percentage spot in otherwise open water. Birds are also a tip-off to feeding fish. When game fish push bait fish up against the surface in open water, birds quickly spot them and pick off wounded bait fish and those swimming just under the surface. Watch for birds that suddenly wheel and change direction. And when they begin diving to the water, you know game fish are not far away. In general, the bigger the bird, the bigger the bait fish. So if only turns are working the bait fish, the prey are probably small. And if gulls join the party, you can suspect that bigger bait fish or squid are being eaten. <laughs> Did you see that? I didn't see it. <laughs> right away. <laughs> you get this in, it's time for a beer. Yes. Even when you know fish are in the area, sometimes you need to narrow the odds even more because the fish might be roving wide areas and you can only effectively cover a circle of about 70 feet around a boat with a fly rod. One way to get close to fish is to run and gun, chasing schools of fish breaking the surface. But you gotta be careful to stay outside of the school of feeding fish because if you run a boat right over a school of feeding fish, they'll go deep and then feed somewhere else. Or you have to bring the fish closer to the boat. You can chum with live or dead bait fish, crabs, or shrimp. Either whole fish or cut up fish are thrown off the stern of the boat to attract fish that might not normally get into casting range. So what we're doing here is we're chumming for these fish. We've got some tuna over here, some skipjacks, maybe some yellow fins, and we're chumming off the stern of the boat, and I've got a big white fly, and I'm just kind of letting it dead drift in the chum and hopefully a tuna will come by and grab it. I'm just gradually letting line out. Jason Franklin and Greg Vincent have done a lot of this tuna fishing here off Grand Bahama Island. 
and they found that this is the best way to do it with a floating line and just a dead drifted fly in the chum, not stripped unless the fish actually come up and start busting. Oh. Yeah! Typically, the fly is allowed to sink naturally without any added motion. But sometimes, fish in a chum slick can be caught on poppers, which is a lot more fun. Some people don't like to fish in chum slicks, but it's hard to argue with the results. Another method, which is as exciting for the helper as the angler, is to tease the fish closer to the boat by casting a hookless plug. When the plug gets close to the boat, the helper yanks the plug from the water and the fly caster casts in the same spot. It looks easy, but it requires precise timing and pinpoint casting. In offshore fly fishing, as with any other kind of saltwater fly fishing, you want to experiment with retrieves. And it's probably best to start with a rapid retrieve because the big fish are chasing bait fish, they're chasing squid, and those things are really booking. They're trying to get out of there and they got nowhere to hide except using their speed. So start with a fast retrieve, try a slow one if that doesn't work, try an erratic one, but you got to experiment with all different kinds of retrieves before you crack the code. There he is! Yeah! Try both a conventional strip and the hand over hand retrieve into a stripping basket. Each gives different actions to the fly. From a boat, it's even more important to keep that rod tip low or in the water because you're further above the water than if you were wading. And the strip strike is essential. Being so far above the water, the hooking angle is really compromised if you raise the rod tip to strike. When you're offshore in a boat, you want to use a heavier fly rod, a 9, 10, 11, or 12. You need the muscle, you need the butt section of that rod to fight a fish when it gets close to the boat. If it sounds, you need to be able to lift the fish. And you also need a heavier line. You want that nine or 10 or 11 or 12 weight line because you're throwing bigger flies generally offshore and you almost always have wind. So nine, 10, 11, 12, and eight weight is a little risky once you get offshore. You really want a bigger reel when you're offshore fly fishing. You need a strong drag because these fish can go a long way and you need a reel that's big enough to hold at least 200 yards of backing. You need a large arbor reel also because the fish may run at you and you want to be able to gather that line quickly. Large arbor reels with their bigger diameter will bring in line quicker. You should also get the best reel you can afford with the strongest drag system. A fast running fish can literally heat up an inferior drag system so much that the drag surfaces melt and the reel begins to smoke. Choose your fly rod based on the size of the fish and the size of the flies you'll be using. Nine weight is fine for fish up to about 25 pounds, but if you plan on casting a giant popper all day, you might want to choose a heavier 10 or 11 weight line to push that big fly out there. 12 weight rods are reserved for fighting very big fish like tarpon and tuna. And fly rods are even made up to a massive 14 weight pool cue, which is used for marlin and other giant fish. You can do some fishing when offshore with a floating line, especially when the fish are right at the surface. But sinking lines are actually more versatile for most fishing other than with poppers. So often when you're fishing a rip, you use a sinking line. Even though the fish look like they're on top, you want to get down a little bit below the waves, and sometimes the bigger fish are deep. So when you're fishing a sinking line, you want to cast it as far as you can, and then strip it back to you carefully, usually fairly rapidly. And then you've got to come in, you've got to come in to about 20 or 30 feet because you can't lift that sinking line off the water very easily. So you can't try to lift, can't try to lift 40 or 50 feet and then you make two quick false casts and shoot the line. Sinking lines go very well into the wind because they're dense, so they shoot into the wind really well. When you're fishing a sinking line, uh, they're very versatile because if you start stripping right away, the fly only rides about this far below the surface. If you, if you wait, the line will get deeper and then you can fish down below. Sinking lines don't aerialize quite as well as floating lines. You want to throw a little bit more open loop, open up your arc, and you want a minimum of a false cast. So if you can get away with it, make one cast and shoot as much line as you can. 
There are many types of sinking lines. Probably the best are full sinking lines, which come in various sink rates from an inch per second to almost eight inches per second. Sink rates vary a lot, so you should take the stated sink rates as guidelines only. The exact sink rate of your fly depends on current, salinity, the line size you're using, and the water resistance of the fly. One of my favorite sinking lines, really my go-to line in saltwater offshore, is a depth charge line. This line has a very fast sinking tip with an intermediate weight running line. The running line is very thin and stays close to the surface, so you can pick up for another cast, and it shoots really well, especially into the wind, because the line is very thin and dense for a given weight. If fish are really close to the surface, a clear tip line is often a good choice. This kind of line has a clear, slow sinking or intermediate weight tip with floating running line. The slow sinking tip gets the line and fly just below the waves and keeps tension on the line, but the floating line lets you pick up and make a quick cast when you need to. If you begin retrieving immediately, you can even fish surface poppers with this line. When you're fishing a sinking line like this, you want to keep your leader short. The reason is that you're fishing a sinking line to get your fly down, and a leader, a long leader, like a nine footer, would tend to buoy the fly up above the bottom. So to keep the fly riding at the same level as your sinking line, keep the leader short. Six feet or under, you can use a you can use a knotless leader, a knotted leader, or you can even use a straight piece of, say, 20-pound monofilament because you're not talking about delicacy here. You're talking about just keeping the fly riding behind the fly line. Fish are not typically as picky about flies in open water as they seem to be more opportunistic when ranging in the open ocean. Of course, if you see baitfish or squid jumping from the water as fish feed, or if a fish you catch spits out some prey, you can tell what length and color they are, and that's the best place to start. Remember, it's not the hook size that matters in saltwater flies, it's the length. And that's why all saltwater flies you see listed in the Orvis website have both hook size and length stated. Most saltwater flies incorporate a lot of white, but sometimes it pays to go to a color that's different than what the fish are feeding on. For instance, few things in nature are fluorescent chartreuse, but that's one of the most productive colors for saltwater flies. In low light, black is actually the most visible against the surface. So in early morning, late evening, and at night, black flies are very popular. Almost as important as size in saltwater flies is the shape or profile of the fly. Some bait fish, like sand eels or needlefish, are long and skinny. Some, like silversides and anchovies, are medium bodied and fish like mullet and herring are very deep bodied. It helps to match the profile of the prevalent bait fish when choosing your flies. Surface flies are a blast in salt water because you can see everything that happens and strikes are dramatic. I ate it! <laughs> oh, that's a nice bluefish. Yeah. Jim, I noticed um, you're using a loop knot on these flies. Right, right. Is that... What, what's the purpose of using a loop instead of a clinch knot? Well, the clinch thing? knot, you have a straight line, and if you're using a 15 to 20 pound mono as your tippet, that's a fairly stiff tippet. So if you're tying a clinch line, you've got a straight line to the loop of the uh, hook, and it doesn't allow the fly to have that much action. Mm -hmm. If you use the loop knot as you've gotten here, uh, you know, when you pause that fly on your retrieve, the current, the wind, or whatever will move Plus that fly. Uh -huh. Yes, right. So it gives it more swing, if you uh -huh. will. And okay. uh, I, th I think it's the most effective uh, knot to use. Okay. And you use the non-slip mono loop right. as your loop knot. That's right. right. Which right. is overhand right. knot through the eye, back through the overhand, five times around. And exactly. Back right. Okay. And frankly, uh, I only turn it around twice on the standing line, and then I test it, and it works really oh, well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yours, yours is more like a home road, more like a home Probably, yeah. Sort of right. home road. And, but, that, and that works with yeah. the two times around. Huh? It's, it's strong. Good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's heavier, yeah, heavier line, it would. Mm -hmm. Heavier line, you'd probably get away with two or three turns. Yeah. Fighting a big fish from a boat far offshore takes all your skill and a little luck. You never know what might happen, so be prepared for anything. The aggressiveness of your strip strike should depend on the size of the fish and the strength of your tippet, 
For softer mouthed species like striped bass, bluefish, or dorado, it doesn't take much to set the hook. For fish with hard, bony mouths like tarpon or tuna, it helps to make a more aggressive strike by combining a long strip with a down and sideways movement of the butt of the rod. For the hard mouthed species, as long as they don't immediately begin a screaming run, many fly fishers give the fish multiple jabs to make sure the hook is set firmly. When you're saltwater fly fishing, it's important to keep that rod tip low when you're stripping the fly and when you're striking the fish. You have more control over the line when the rod tip is low. When you want to strike a fish, it's just one long strike, one long strip. It's called a strip strike. And then once you feel the fish, then you can raise the rod tip and play the fish. If you do have problems with raising the rod tip as you would in trout fishing, because it's a tough reflex to get out of, it, it's perfectly okay to put your rod tip right down in the water. That way, you keep that rod tip low and you can't really strip strike. You can't really raise that rod tip because you've got, you've got resistance on the rod tip, so it really helps you to strip strike. Drag should be set and tested before you start fishing because trying to adjust a drag setting when a fish is running can often result in a lost fish when you suddenly put too much pressure on the fish. Once a fish reaches the end of its run, begin to apply as much pressure as you dare to turn it. The bigger the fish, the more pressure you should apply, and the pressure should be constant as long as a fish is not running. If a fish gets a chance to rest, it'll only prolong the fight and risk not being able to revive the fish. When a fish is right below the boat like this, you want to try to keep that rod from gumming above your waist. So you want to give a quick lift and then reel, and then a quick lift and then reel, and never bring that rod up too high. The fly rod just isn't meant when a fish is right under the boat to be brought right up here over your head. Another thing you shouldn't do when fighting a decent sized fish like this, that we all do and we shouldn't, is to put your hand on the rod here to get extra leverage because a fly rod isn't meant to be flexed from here. It's meant to be flexed all the way down into the handle. And we all do it, but you shouldn't because you can break a rod that way. Once a fish gets close to the boat, use side pressure to turn it. The fish will go wherever you point its head. Keep the fish off balance and you'll tire it quicker. When you switch the rod from side to side, do it slowly and smoothly. Otherwise, you might introduce slack in the line and lose the fish. For fish that frequently jump like tarpon, barracuda, or mako sharks, always bow to the fish when it jumps. Lower the rod tip quickly and point it at the fish to introduce slack into the line. If a big fish lands on a tight line or leader, there's a good chance the leader will break. Oh, you put on that, you put on that little dog. Yeah, I put on a little surf candy. Caught this fish on a very small, very small bait fish. I mean, talk about, uh, you know, big fish, big fly, but sometimes just a little, that's the kind of bait fish he's eating. It's no different releasing a fish offshore as it is in any other place, except you don't want to hang too far over the side. Gently revive a fish you intend to release until it can take off under its own power. You know, it's rare to have a day offshore without some wind. So let's visit Pete Kutzer for some timely tips on casting big flies in the wind. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer from the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today we're going to talk about casting in windy conditions. But there are some things we can do to help deal with that wind. A wind coming at you, a wind coming at your non-casting shoulder, a wind coming at your casting shoulder or behind you, there are different casts we can do for each one of these situations. Let's start off with a wind coming directly at you. A wind coming straight at you is not the worst wind to deal with. There's a couple things we can do. The first is make a low angle cast and get below the wind. If we can send that fly out underneath the wind, we can deliver that fly to our target. Watch shorebirds when they're flying around at the beach. They almost fly between the waves. There's a lot less wind down low. Another option is to make a high angle back cast and drive that fly down through the wind down to the water. You don't get the best presentation when you're making that cast, but it can help deal with those windy conditions. When you're dealing with a wind coming at your non-casting shoulder, I'm right-handed, so if that wind was blowing at my left shoulder, what I might have to do is compensate for that wind a little bit. I can send that fly a little bit more to the left of that target, and hopefully that wind will blow it on track, 
or just like with that wind coming at me, I can cast below the wind, making that low angle cast and getting that fly out to target. If I have a wind blowing at my back, that wind can be a little more difficult than you think. You want to make a low angle back cast and get that line underneath the wind, make sure that line gets out nice and straight, then we can make that higher angle forward cast. The cast almost looks a little bit like an oval. We're going to make a low back cast, bring the rod tip up, then a high forward cast to deliver that fly out to our target. The worst wind you can deal with is a wind blowing at your casting shoulder. When you're dealing with that wind, that can, in some cases, blow that fly right into you, hooking yourself. I've hooked myself in the neck, in the ear, in the back, even in the rear end. It's not very comfortable. So there's a couple techniques. One technique is actually taking that rod tip and angling it over your left hand shoulder. Make a high angle cast and get that line off your shoulder, above you. Uh, one friend used to describe it as combing your hair. Comb your hair, and that's going to keep that fly off of that left shoulder. Another technique is to switch hands. Practice casting with your non-dominant hand. I practice all the time and it really does help in those windy conditions. But perhaps the easiest technique to deal with those windy conditions at your casting shoulder is to simply turn your back to the wind and make a back cast delivering that fly to the fish. That's going to keep that fly well away from you, keep you nice and safe, and help you catch more fish. I really love the visceral aspect of fishing offshore for big fish. It's always intense, stuff happens so fast, and often much of the fishing is visual, which really adds a lot to it. If you crave really big fish on your fly rod and want to test your wits and your muscles with the biggest and fastest fish you can catch on a fly rod, then hop on a boat and get offshore. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet.